Okay? All right. So, so today's uh, lesson, we're going to switch from talking about the open die forging that we spent the last several weeks on <clears throat> and talk about closed die forgings. And I know that Dr. Metzloff covers up this a little bit, um, so if it's really, really a super review of things that he did, let me know and we'll jump so that we don't spend a lot of time on something you've already seen. Um, the material that I have is uh, largely from some older reference books that I, that I have in my personal collection. We don't do a lot of true closed die forging in Scott Forge, so it's not a, a something that I'm uh, an expert on. I will cover material here. The first several uh, half part of this is uh, actually just copies of one of the uh, books that I have. And so you, you should have access to these lectures at some point so you can <coughs> go back and review them in more detail if you're interested in that. Um, so I'll try to hit the, the high points, the things that I'm familiar with. But if you have questions, please ask. We'll have a you know, discussion around I know Dr. Mitzloff has some experience with this as well, so I think we should be able to cover it in sufficient detail. So a question to start with is why bother with a drop forging or a closed die forging? Uh, in some respects, that's the same as why you use a forging of any type. The issues of strength, directional properties, um, things like this. Here we have the, uh, the stand, well, unpredictable is really more, and more directional loading. Um, minimum machine time, we talked about that. Savings of material. Um, Elimination of internal defects is largely something you're going to get through the open die process or through the preparation of the raw material uh, going into a closed die operation. But the big reason to do it uh, in comparison to, say, an open die process is that it gets you closer to the final shape. So you have a lot less machining that needs to be done. Um, and so it's great when you have enough pieces to justify all the extra cooling costs associated with the method. Um, <clears throat> again, we've got benefits of rain flow. We spent quite a bit of time talking about that in an earlier lecture, and that's certainly very true in closed eye, and probably even more pronounced in the closed eye world. So here we see some cross sections of uh, a crankshaft. You can see uh, one illustration showing a casting, another how it, it would look if you machine from a bar, and then a third showing how in the forging, you're able to force the metal to flow around the corners and get the, the benefit of the grain flow. It's exactly the same as we talked about in an earlier lesson. When you, when you say grain, are you saying the actual grains of metal, or are we talking about the actual, let's say, you know, defects like, uh, or not really defects, but non-metallic inclusions? Sure. So it's it's really uh, a lot of it's kind of both, but your your non-metallics in particular, your main sulfides are going to be forced to bend around those contours. Um, but you know, your individual, if you think about your individual grains, we have grains at, uh, say, room temperature, right? We can do, but we also have grains that are, are austenite grains at forging temperature. Now, when we do, uh, when we're forging, we're forging in the austenite range, so those grains are rather large and can be forced to bend and flow and do all that stuff. Once we go through heat treatment, we're going to nucleate new austenite grains. We'll talk about this more in a later lecture. We're going to nucleate new austenite grains. If you do heat treat correctly, those new austenite grains are going to be small, which is really advantageous for a lot of mechanical properties. We know that there's a direct relationship between grain size and, 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 um, and things like impact properties and top um, So you are forcing both the metal grains and the non-metallics to flow around those corners, and that does give you those directional properties that we talked about. Uh, we talked about already the minimum of uh, machining, savings in material, uh, the issue of closing up shrinkage cavities uh, and other types of internal problems. Again, that's largely going to happen during the preparation of the stock. Uh, not as much during the forging of a closed eye forging. <clears throat> so then materials, really any of the materials that we would use in an open die forging application could be also done with closed eye work. Uh, just, you know, uh, pretty much anything there. And there's there's other materials that, uh, that say for example, Scott Forge doesn't work with, but that are still forged. Uh, so, say for example, things like uh, jet engine blade blades, things like that, where you're dealing with 
nickel super alloys. Uh, those are forged. Uh, there's a company actually here in Wisconsin that specializes that. They're not all that far away from us, Laddish, uh, and Kudahe. Uh, they're uh, very well known in the industry can. for closed yeah. back forging, uh, a lot of them for aerospace applications. Um, some of their equipment, they're, they're known for having uh, what's called a counter blow hammer. So we, we might, we'll see some, some regular hammers here later on. But in their particular situation, they have a machine where both the ram and the anvil are in motion, and they are in motion in opposite directions because they hit one another at a certain point. Um, and so that's a kind of a unique setup. I'm sure there's more than one in the world, but there's not very many of them. Uh, and they're used for generating very, very high strain rates, very high loads to fill uh, intricate cavities and to make things that are, have a very high flow stress. I remember from a couple of lectures ago, I put up graph that showed you know, how easy it is to move different materials at different temperatures. I didn't have on that graph things like inconels and titaniums and some of the uh, you know, unique alloys that are used for aerospace applications, but those have some of them very high flow stresses, so you have to have very, very high strain rates uh, and impacts to make them move. Um, this is not maybe our best focus or Copy. Yeah, uh, but this is just giving some details of specific alloys that at the time of this writing that this, this book was published, which is probably back around the mid-1950s, things that were commonly used in, in the closed eye world. There's a lot more now because we've advanced our knowledge and understanding of metals and their applications. So, so this is really just, a, a, just kind of scratching the surface. Uh, a bit about the equipment. Uh, so the, the drop hammer, or, or uh, so I'll just, I'll just preface this by saying there are hammers and then there are also presses, and there's different types of both uh, that are used to make uh, closed eye forgings. Um, we have, uh, let's see, So right here, this is one type of hammer is called a board drop hammer or a gravity hammer. And so what you do in that circumstance is you have your ram, in this case here, is connected to a, a, a big wooden board and there's a lifting mechanism that lifts it up and just releases it and just drops under the weight of gravity. Those kinds of uh, tools are good for small forges. Uh, you also have hammers where the hammer is accelerated down either by compressed air or by steam. Those hammers are quite large. Um, I know down in the Chicago area, there's a company that has one that has a 50,000 pound ram weight. So you have that much that's falling, but it's not falling under gravity. It's accelerated down by compressed steam. Uh, in the case of the hammers, uh, the way that you have effect, that you, that you transfer the energy from the falling or accelerated mass to the workpiece is through uh, an anvil which is uh, shown here. The anvil is actually very, very large. And if you go and see a hammer like this in operation, you're not gonna see most of this. Most of this is below ground. So what this little chart is that's shown here is uh, Chambersburg Engineering, which is a company that is no longer in business, but for over 100 years, they specialized in making forging hammers and other types of forging equipment. They came up with this chart that is a, a description of how efficient a forging operation is going to be uh, based on a comparison of the ram weight and the anvil. You can see that uh, you have to get quite high. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I think asymptotic would be the right description to term that, but you, you, you get to a point where you really don't gain much more in efficiency, but that, that point is when your anvil has a weight that's about 20 times the falling weight of the ram. So um, in, in our shop, uh, our hammer shop that Scott Forge has down in uh, Franklin Park, we, our biggest hammer is about 10,000 pounds falling weight. And the anvil on that machine, I think, is about 150,000 pounds. Um, I don't think they got it all the way up to, to 20 times. But if you were to go and see uh, like that 50,000 pound hammer, you're going to see that that is you know, substantially bigger. You won't see it because it's all buried in the ground. It's like an iceberg. 
That's very different than a press. When, we, when I showed you hydraulic presses and the things that we do in the open die world, there you don't have a big mass that has to resist a load. The press is a, an assembly and it's a frame that holds everything together so the ram is pushing against the back side of the frame so everything is contained. But in the case of a hammer, that anvil is actually somewhat independent of the, of the rest of the machine. And so it, it has to have enough mass to resist the blow of the hammer to not move um, and also not break. Uh, so hammers like that, when they're set up, you have this big mass of anvil. And underneath the anvil, you have a bunch of wood. They typically use white oak, big white oak timbers that are crisscrossed. So when we set up a hammer like that, it's got forged. You've got about four feet of wood. And it's essentially a big, giant cushion. And then underneath that, you have concrete. But the concrete isn't really there to resist the blow of the hammer. It's there just to provide the foundation of the structure so the item doesn't sink into the ground. It's the anvil that's really resisting all that load. So the anvil has to be big enough to make that happen. Uh, there's an illustration of the lifting mechanism for a board drop hammer. And this one on the, on the right, on this side here, this here is a steam cylinder. Now, in a lot of shops today, they've transitioned away from using compressed steam and they use compressed air. That's what was done in our Scott Forge facility a few years ago. Uh, some of the advantages of doing that largely have to do with uh, safety. If you have a boiler that is going to generate compressed steam, you have to maintain that and have to have that inspected. And typically, you've got state inspections. And usually, they're at least annual because if you have a failure, the boiler can explode and then that can be quite hazardous. Uh, so it's something that a lot of companies are moving away from. Uh, you can have an air compressor, and you get big industrial air compressors, and there's, you don't have the safety uh, issues associated with that. The only real difference, you can use the same pieces of equipment. The only difference is that uh, the, the seals inside the cylinders have to be changed to be matched with compressed air rather than the uh, characteristics they need for compressed steam. Other than that, they're, they're basically the same. Uh, here, and this isn't really all that pertinent to our class, but you can spend time on it if you're interested in the mechanisms of how the steam or compressed air would flow in, that, in those valve systems on those hammers. Uh, skip through that. Uh, uh, again, they're, they're kind of just highlighting some of the unique things that they had with their design. These pictures are old black and white pictures. They didn't copy over uh, the best, but you can see how that, where the operator is standing in relation to the, to the work. Um, this one, again, not the greatest copy. Uh, I would encourage you to take a little bit of time and go out on YouTube. There's lots of really good. We, we showed a couple of vi videos. Did you see those already? Yeah. So you've seen the basics of how those machines work. Um, one of the things that I've been impressed by in the videos that I've seen is that quite often you'll see in the operation of these, you'll see a lot of flame. Uh, when the dies come together, there's quite often a fireball that shoots out right where the operator would have to stand. I mean, he's typically off the side, you be hurt. That flame is from two things. It's from whatever the die lubricant is that they're using. Sometimes they use sawdust in there to keep the workpiece from sticking. Remember, a lot of this is fairly intricate contour stuff. So there's a lot of surface area, a lot of uh, opportunity for that piece of metal that you're deforming to want to stick to the die. So you use a lubricant, uh, not only to keep it from sticking, but also to help it flow, help that metal flow into all those uh, bits of geometry. And so sometimes those lubricants are flammable. When that happens, you get the big fireball. I think it also, does it, does it cut down the wear a little bit? Uh, oh yeah, it certainly would, absolutely. Yeah, you're, you're gonna have, if you're thinking about uh, about, say, tooling failure mechanisms. The, the way the tools fail in a closed die shop is going to be somewhat different than how they would fail in an open die shop. In the open die shop, you use really simple tools to make a lot of different shapes. They will undergo thermal fatigue. They, they will not so much wear, uh, they, will, they will walk, what we call, we call it washing out. It's kind of wear, but really what is happening is that over time, as you use the die throughout the course of the day, you can actually get the die to turn red hot on the working surface continue to use it and it's not a high alloy material, you'll just deform it. And so you'll have a low spot there. And so then you'll have to eventually uh, repair that. In the case of uh, closed eye world, you're going to have a lot more actual physical wear because of the oxide layer that's on the part. And 
it's going to interact with the tooling, and so you will actually start to erode the tool over time. The dimensions will change, and you'll have to uh, remake the tools, repair the tools, and there are mechanisms to do that. Three to six thousand pieces, I think, is a is oh, a three number to six. I've been here. Sure, that seems reasonable. So here are some uh, illustrations of the output of the, of the forging process, the drop forging process. And some things I want to draw your attention to. Um, we have in, on this right here, almost all of these are shown as they come out of the dies. And so what we see is that we have this extra metal here. It's called flash. It's trimmed off eventually, um, but it actually is quite important. Um, and I don't know if, how much I get into it in this lecture, but I'm reading some other materials where they talk about um, how the tools have to be designed in some cases to actually lock together uh, because of the geometry of the part. So you'll design your tools to, to have an interlocking characteristic. Otherwise, they would be forced apart. They would be forced to shift uh, because of the part geometry. Quite often, you'll see that the, the tools are set up to create multiple pieces in the same uh, Origin. So they would call this a platter, and you have, in this case, three pieces in the platter. Here you have two. So those will all be separated later. Here's two chain hooks in the platter. Uh, and then out here we have things that have been forged and then uh, trimmed. Uh, point out, this is a, a big crank uh, shaft. And when you make a crank shaft in, in this style of closed eye yeah. work, you have to design your tool so that this has got a, a parting line uh, so that all of the uh, all of the throws are in the same plane during forging. Otherwise, you, you can't really create that form with just uh, two tools, uh, you know, top and bottom die. So what they would do is they would make that forging, and then after the forging's done, they actually reheat it and twist it to get each of these throws into the correct alignment around the circumference of the shaft. Now, I don't think I have any illustrations of this, but there's a much more modern way of making large cranks. Um, uh, I know that the Elwood Forging Group has some of these uh, pieces of equipment where instead of forging the whole crank all at once in one plane, you forge one segment of the crank in, a, in an upsetting press that upsets the metal into a, a die of a specific geometry to create that individual throw. And then you'll do multiples of these, so you maybe have a dozen or however many that you need to them make. So you use an induction heater to locally heat one segment, you put it in the upsetter, you upset it, create that, move on to the next piece, run all the pieces you have, then you come back and start over, you heat the next segment, change the tooling, and work the next segment. You keep doing that all the way down the piece until it's all done. So the advantage of that is that you don't have to realign the throws at all because you can forge them into the, into the correct alignment to begin with. By using an induction heater, you have much less oxidation, which is a big deal. So when I was in college, I had a chance to visit a shop that doesn't exist anymore where they were making these kinds of parts for the railroad industry. So they were making cranks that weighed about 2,000 pounds, and they were forging them under a 50,000 pound steam hammer, and they came all out in one plane. And that was kind of in the old part of their shop. And then they had a brand new addition where they put in one of these presses, and I was able to see um, they were just getting it up and running. And it was really interesting to see difference in oxide layer thickness. So if you have a, uh, say this piece might start as a 12 inch square uh, billet, um, and in, in, the, in the old method of forging it, um, and you put the whole thing in a furnace and it takes several hours to heat up, maybe even longer than that, and in that time you have quite a thick layer of oxidation that's built up. And then you go forge that, and a lot of that oxide ends up being pounded into the surface of the parts. And then you have to spend additional time chipping or grinding to get that out before you go into machining operations. Uh, plus, you have to twist the thing to get it all lined up. They found that when they put the induction heater in and moved this other method, the oxide layer thickness went way down. It went from you know an eighth of an inch or three sixteenths or even a quarter of an inch thickness to just a few thousandths. I think it was 12 or 15 thousandths of an inch. So not only did your oxide layer thickness go down, but you also had less uh, losses of carbon on the surface, so you had less decarbonization on the surface. Um, so there were a lot of advantages. And the heating time went way down, too. I don't know if anybody, well, so I know if anybody's using induction heating for casting, it's the same technique. You're just not going quite so hot. You're just heating for 
reporting it. Induction is a very fast way to keep material. So you'll see that a lot of the uh, closed eye forging industry has moved to induction heating. It's fast, it's fairly clean, uh, it's energy efficient, um, so it's, it's got a lot of advantages. It's not used in the world of open die forging because for induction to be really efficient, you have to take the coil and size it closely to the workpiece you want to heat. And after, in, you know, in the case of the big open die forge, if you, you've heated something up, you take and change its shape dramatically, but if you need to reheat it, it's now some much different size and shape than it was originally. So you'd have to have sort of an innumerable number of, of coils, induction coils, to make that work. It's just not practical in the open die world. But in the closed die world, where you're typically getting everything done in one heating cycle, Induction's a great way to go. Any questions? So now we'll talk a little bit about the design of forgings. This particular forging, just some kind of a connecting device, but we can see that instead of being all in a single plane, this does have some sweeping curves to it. And it, it has two different diameter holes, and it has a bit of a taper to it. Uh, from from here down to here. So all that has to be accounted for when you design the tools. Here's a, another view of that same part. You can see uh, the two couple of different views. And they point out here that you have to have what they call draft. Uh, now that's very different than the draft we talked about in open die work where I'm talking about draft being how much the dies come together. Here, we're talking about relief. This is basically the same type of draft you have on pattern and casting. You've got to be able to get it out of the mold, right? So the same is true here. This has to be able to come clear of the tools. If you made this with a perfectly straight side, it would be stuck in the tool. And it might come out after it cools off enough and shrinks and pulls away from the tooling, but that's not very efficient. So these are always designed with a certain amount of, of draft or relief here. And a lot of times, for the things they make, uh, you know, that surface may not even need to be machined afterwards. Uh, maybe the critical dimensions are this hole and that hole, and the rest of it is not really all that critical, you know, within some generous tolerances, so there's no, no other machining maybe required. So here they're showing uh, where the parting line or the flash line would be, uh, and they're showing how they've changed the design a little bit to make it easier to manufacture. So not, not that we would get into that a lot in this class, but as engineers and as designers, it's sometimes necessary to tweak the design of a component to make it easier or cheaper to make. They're also showing uh, the change in cross-section here uh, because in this case, it's gonna help the tooling last longer. So again, some of these Design differences are, uh, you know, something that you'd have to work out. The, the say the tooling, the tooling manufacturer, the forging manufacturer would have to work that out with the end user and make sure that any of these changes are still going to result in parts that has adequate performance. But you work through all that to get something that's going to work for both both the manufacturer and the end user. So on that on that right hand side there, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask the class here. What? Why do you think that one on the top would wear more at the edges? than the one on the bottom. Think about how the metal flows. What's the answer? Friction. Friction, well, look at the angle. So remember the metal's gonna go out through that, that little gap, the gutter in the side, right? So on the oval part, it's closer to the angle of the exit, right? going to want to turn off the side, and the other one's got like almost a, you know, not quite a 90 degree angle there, but it's going to wear those, it's going to have to squeeze between those, it's a little gap there, you don't see it on that part, but you're going to have to have a little gutter all the way around the outside edge, right? So, yeah. Also, when you have this kind of a, this is a fairly sharp corner here, and you have this big radius. Yeah, it's hard to here. fill. Very difficult. Yeah, yeah. you're going to need more pressure to push it into that corner then. That's not to say that it would be impossible to make. You could probably make it, but you're going to need bigger equipment. You're going to need different die materials, so things are going to be more costly. Yeah, yeah. re, re, re tool, yeah, actually, re uh, machine the tool more often or something. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 
<coughs> questions before we move on? Yeah? The uh, surface area to volume ratio thing for the circle and the square? Um, are you talking about like sort of casting, like modulus or something? No, I'm talking like, so if you have less surface area on the circle, you have less friction? Is that what you're saying? No, it's just the shape is easier yeah. to fill in. Okay. Think about okay. taking a piece of putty and trying to fill it into a very sharp corner okay. versus just filling it into a nice curve. So uh, the, the example, cavity. like if you took, yeah, if you took, uh, you took Play-Doh and you took a coffee mug, you also took Play-Doh and you took uh, a soup bowl, and you press the press the Play-Doh into both the bottom of both. It's going to be not not possible, but certainly harder to get the bottom of the coffee mug that has kind of a sharp corner. And the bowl is a nice smooth curve, right? That's what the same concept is here. Any other questions? Okay. It's kind of acting like a a fluid, like hydraulics, mm -hmm. but like a really, you know, not very liquid hydraulics. Right, but it is, you're, you're forcing a solid to undergo flow, right? You're applying that much load. So, so it is, you know, things, it's very similar to think about, if you're thinking about how much water pressure it takes to go through a large pipe versus a small pipe. It's not a bad analogy here, similar concept. And so here they show kind of the, uh, the final design for the, for the uh, tooling. Now we'll talk about the process. Uh, so here, so how do we, I guess the, the real question is we know what we want to make. How do we figure out how to get there from some start, right? Now that particular part's not a terribly complex shape, uh, but we have at work at Scott Ford, we have made some very complex shapes. And I've seen the finished parts, and like I, I see the finished part, and I, I know generally how it's made, having witnessed the process. But somebody had to figure out how to implement that, how to make that work, and that that takes a lot of skill and talent. What they're going to they're showing you here are the steps to make that little forging that we just were looking at. So they're going to start in this case with a square cross section, uh, and they're making the point that this is that round rounded corner. That's actually fairly significant. When you have things that have really sharp square corners in the world of forging, it's very easy for those to fold over on themselves to create a crack, or we, we call it a lap. So steel mills routinely will roll round corners, uh, squares. Um, and it's easier for them than either they don't get the, the, the defects either. And of course, the people that are making closed back forgings like that as a starting shape. So they're going to take a round corner square, and they're going to go into this first die. Now, this is not going to make the final shape, but what this does, these two grooves place the metal where they need it for the two uh, parts that did the holes in the two little circular sections. And then this flat section here reduces this down into uh, something that's closer to the thickness they need for that middle, middle component. And then right here, this is a, a tongue so in this case, this is going to be a forging that's actually going to be handled by an individual, by somebody with, with this pair of tongs. Uh, you could do this with a robot. That's not unusual today. We've got a lot of, a lot of robotics now in, uh, in all kinds of manufacturing, so you might uh, have this all be done automatically with robotics. Uh, but there's still plenty of things that are done with handheld work. So now they're looking at the tools that are going to create the final form. And here we have these two in a different plane. You've got a big angle here. So you can make a tool that will, that will do that. Uh, and they're showing first a tool that will create the bend. And then secondly, a tool that will create the finished profile and actually put the holes in. Now, you can build all those different functions into one chunk of steel, and that's what they've done here. So the first stage would be to form your little square bar into this. Then you move over here and bend it, and then you come to the middle position and actually finish the work. The middle position is where you're going to have the most load applied because you're trying to fill, fill the, the nooks and crannies and get the last little bits of detail done. Um, so they're going to put that typically in the center of the die because you don't want to have extremely high loads off-center. That's not good for your equipment. Right? 
Okay, so they, they do that there. Now, over here, they're showing you different ways of laying things out within the die. And remember I said that in some cases you need to design your die so that they interlock, and that's what they're showing here. If they didn't have this little pad here, this angle would tend to push the, the top die out of alignment with the bottom die. So they have to include that to, to get everything to lock and keep the correct orientation. So this is what the top or bottom, this is, I guess the bottom, this is what the bottom die looks like if there's a mat a mating top die. And you can see now what the finished part looks like uh, here with the flash, the excess metal still in place. Now, the flash, it looks like it's just wasted material, but it actually has an important role to play. And that is that as you make the flash, things get thin. When, when the metal is thin, it's hard for it to move. That's both good and bad. It's hard for it to move, so it takes a lot of force, but it also means that if you've got some thicker section back here, by pinching this off, you force the metal to stay in that, in that cavity where you need that detail. So the, the understanding and application of flash and where it is uh, and when it develops within the forging process is actually quite important to making sure that you get the metal where you need it in the finished part of it. Questions on that before we move on. Okay. So once the forging is complete, we don't need the flash anymore. So that has to be removed. So they use uh, various types of tools, usually presses, uh, to trim that off. And there's this very simple uh, shearing tools to do that. And there's the finished forging. Now. Just to kind of go through the basic process, if you were in a, in a closed die shop, you would receive raw material, bars of various sorts. They would go, be cut the length, they'd be heated, go through uh, the forging process, go through a trimming process, and then they would go on to heat treatment. Yeah. So we're going back to the flash. Mm -hmm. So these these dies are made so that the flash is intentionally created. That's these? right. That's right. Um, yeah. How do they control? This flash can also be an issue as far as like some might more material and cool. Is there like an issue of it like not building up completely then since there is excess material going outside? Is there a possibility that you end up having the die somewhat not built? I mean like 95% of it's built Sure. Instead? Yeah, right. So that's a, that's a, that is an issue. That's a design part of the tool, how you design the tools to make sure that they, they fill completely. So you have to um, kind of the, the tooling designer that would be considered a highly skilled job has, has to understand that. Today, we would use computer models to validate that before we would actually make the tools. Um, at the time that this book was written back in the 50s, they would uh, use a lot of uh, experience-based decision-making to create that, and then they probably would use something like lead or another soft metal to prove out the concept before they start making uh, parts. The other thing that they would do is they would make a few parts and then they would actually take the parts with saw and then split them uh, and then etch them, do what's called a macro etch, so that they could see the flow lines, but they'd also be able to see, certainly if there's areas that don't fill, those would be fairly easy to pick out even without doing the etch. But sometimes you might have the metal that is flowing, you're squeezing it, and if you haven't designed the tool correctly, the metal flows out, and then it actually is pushed back in on itself. And if that happens, then you have a, a lap or crack. So if, if there's certain specifications that we deal with at Scott Forge where we're, we're asked to do this type of etching, um, and we're told to look for something called re-entrant angles. So when you look at the grain flow on a macro edge, you're looking at the, how the metal moving, and if you see a spot where the grain flow shows that metal coming back in on itself, that's an indication that the tooling wouldn't be isn't designed correctly. Um, we run into that once or twice. It's not real common, um, but it, it can happen. Um, that could also be a, not just a tool design issue, but it could be a starting stock issue. If your starting stock isn't the right size for the tooling, then you could have other problems that are caused. So they have to balance both. We lost our cell uh, for a few seconds. Oh, maybe we saw. Uh, I think I, I just talk loud for a couple of seconds because right. I got you on here now. 
Any other questions on that? Okay. Uh, so here's a, another forging that they've worked through. Not showing the tooling, but showing the steps. Uh, this one's a connecting rod. Wyman Gordon is a company that's still around. They're still very active in the closed eye forging world. And here you can see that they started with a piece of bar stock. They've done a little bit of forming work and created a tong hole. And they've done more forming work. And these processes, some of these early processes, could be open die forging. Um, that might be done on a separate piece of equipment, or it could be that your your forging die has a um, a. Tool that rain would have a, 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 a some metal 
here to help us form this negative space. And we would have a punch that would have this profile so that we could, uh, and we would have to figure out what, what shape the metal needs to be going into the tool. It's probably going to be a fairly simple shape, like a disc of some size. We make that disc, put the disc up here, and then put the punch on top of the disc and force the disc to come down. But because you've got metal that's you know, being acted on by this region, that metal's got to go somewhere, so it's probably going to go up in this direction. So you have to calculate, figure out exactly what that, what we call preform, needs to be so that all the metal ends up in the right places when you're done and you have the minimal amount of flash. In our case, because it's not really a close, a true closed eye forging, um, you might not need the flash in the same way that I mentioned before, where you're using the flash to help lock the metal in place and keep it inside the tool. In our case, it's rare that we're doing that, so we are relying on some other things. So here's the cross-section of the simulation. Here's a blue is one tool, and we have a, another tool out, out here, and then a third tool, the punch, up on the top. And you can see here, right away, that, that you've got, uh, this, this would be forged as a disc, so you have the corner, the lower corner of the disc is immediately being acted on by this blue section of the tool. So that metal, again, it has to go somewhere. Do you take the scale off of these at all before you put them in the dice? Yeah, quite often you would. So, so you probably make that disc um, and then reheat it before you put it in these tools. When you bring it back to the uh, press, you probably put it on edge and roll it a little bit. Just You're talking about the, the actual the forging. actual forging, right? Yeah. So you, you take this disc, uh, you bring it to the press, you put it on edge, and you, you roll it and hit it a little bit going around the circumference awesome. to get the scale to pop off. Then you bring the tools to the press, put this in, and it's got, you know, it's going to have some oxidation because you're not working in a vacuum. So you, even though you knock off the bulk of it, it'll, it'll get some. But you're, you're trying to just have a minimal amount. The other thing that we often do is you, you say, get this in and you deform it part way. Uh, but this tool here uh, doesn't fit the ring. So you can lift the hole once you get it kind of in a certain amount. You can pick the whole assembly up and then use compressed air to blow out any oxidation that's, say, on this lower lower die so that you don't have that contaminating your, your work piece. We have problems with it yeah. again. It's kind of a cheap going in, so. Okay. Let's see, hold on one second. And then for this particular part, 
there's a hole that goes all the way through here, so they show the tool that's used at the end to punch that hole all the way through. So that's all the simulation. Now here it is in real life. So there's a, a big disk of material, a tool on the floor, and we've talked a little bit about oxidation. I just want to point out this is a pile of oxide. This is a typical thing to see. We did that kind of thing several times a day at our, in our shop. They go around with a small little skid steer and they clean that up. So oxides are, are a big deal for us. We don't want them pressed into our work any more than the closed eye guys would. So uh, we work hard to keep that stuff off of the off of finished forgings. So there's your, your disc. And there's the disc sitting on the tool and the punch in place. And now that punch has been pushed uh, part way down. You've got the outside wind tool, and there's an inside tool here that we showed in the cross-section view earlier. You can see the top die. The top die is being rotated as they push this down. So as they're pushing down, some, of, some metal is bending and some metal is flowing up into this area here. Oops, went too fast. There's that. Now they've got the punch pretty much all the way in. You can see there's just a little bit of metal that's sticking up above the edge of the tool. The tool in this case becomes the, the, the stop or the, the registration point for this other guy. So you just push down until you hit the, the tool. The tool is cold, it's not going to be formed. And so you just use that as your reference and then you rotate that top die and work your way around the circumference, pushing that metal down as it bulges up. Here's another view. You can really see here now where it's kind of bulging up. You see it's, it's, it's bulged up. It's higher here than it is here, but you've got this gap. So we have to push this metal back down to fill that so we get a nice clean geometry. And there's what it looks like when it's done. And there's the tool, there's the forging now after the hole has been punched, you can see it. This is what it looks like when it's cold. How did you get that? It looks like that was a separate piece. It was stuck in the part right there. The last slide. The previous slide? Yeah. Here? Right? So um, how do you get it out of there? So the way you would get that out is you would take this out and you would stand it up on edge and you would forge the edge just a little bit and that would cause this whole thing to flex a little bit and pop that tool right out. Really? Yep. Yep. And then once that punch is out, then that, that punch, if you remember, had a little flat spot on it which served as a registration point for the, the actual punch they would use to drive through to create that through hole. What would that be used for? Uh, that could be some type of a large nozzle uh, or a huge like pipe reducer or something like that. I don't know that that was the application. I'm just kind of speculating. Unfortunately, a lot of times I don't know all the uses for the things that we make. Sometimes I do, and it's a lot of fun when I get to know that. But there's probably more often than not, the customer just says, here's the shape. We might know the industry that they're in, or we might not. And, you know, we feel fortunate when we get that extra piece of information. Here's another view of the same thing. You can see what it looks like on the bottom. So the simulation process worked really well in helping us design the tools and coming up with determining which press we need to use to make that part, because um, you can simulate the loads. And uh, so we found the simulation tools to be very, very helpful. Um, so Here's an example of another forging, this one being something that we would uh, do under a hammer. Um, and, uh, and now here's a, uh, so I want to just take you through several different examples of forgings that have been made using simulation. Some of them are close to being closed eye, some of them are a combination of closed eye and open eye. This particular one, you're seeing a cross-section view of this big ball shape piece. And this is made out of precipitation hardening stainless steel. This is 17-4. And this, I, I showed pictures of these actually in an earlier lesson. These are spools that take up the cable on an aircraft carrier that are used to catch the planes when they land. So uh, this is not, I mean, this is 
this is not a very thick cross section relative to this diameter. It's you know six feet uh, in diameter. So this is one that's made by making a disc and then forging the disc into some special tools to bend it into this funnel shape. Um, we had to be whoops. Yeah, no, here we go. So we had to be concerned about how much tonnage, about some centering of parts with respect to the tools. Uh, that if things get off center, then they don't forge correctly. Because of how tall this is and the, and the height of the tools necessary, you're concerned about how much space you have between the dies. That's what we call daylight. Um, so that's going to that's going to limit which presses we can use because they're all different. Um, the stresses on the tooling. Um, we, it's important. This is actually really important understanding loads on tooling because it's possible to make tools and put them in a service and then overload the tool and have it fail. If the tool fails in service, actually Alex knows all about that from a situation that happened while he was there. Uh, if the tool fails in service, you uh, you can have really dangerous situations created where, where things start to fly around the shop in a very uncontrolled and unsafe way. So it's very important for us to understand how much load is needed, A, to move the metal we want to move, and then B, design our tooling around that and, and then not overload it, because now we have the capacity uh, with some of the bigger presses we have and some of the older tooling that we have to actually overload the tool with, with, the, uh, with the, the power of some of these presses. So we actually have to figure out what is the safe working limit for that tool and then design that into the job description so we don't cause an unsafe situation. But what, what thick materials would you use for your tooling? A lot of our tools for like this type of work that we're talking about here are 4340 or 4330. So the stuff we used for our... our uh, pry bar? Our pry bar. Pry bar was 4130. 4130. Yeah, so we're, we're looking for things that have um, higher hardenability than 4130 because we're dealing in much bigger sections. So we want some through hardening type characteristics. Um, we're not looking for super high hardness and wear resistance like we would if we were dealing, say, we're like with an O1 or an A2 or something like that. We need much better toughness than that. Um, the metal that we're forging is hot, so it doesn't have to, you know, doesn't have to resist like, uh, say, the loads you get if you're cold shearing something. But we need it to be able to withstand um, a lot of, you know, you're, you're, when, you're, when you're pressing something in, and there's a, you know, a big hoop stress on a lot of these things because they're rigged. So you've got to have a lot of fairly high tensile uh, and high toughness. So the, the 4330 in particular is a really good combination. It's fairly low in carbon, but still high hardenability. We use that grade a lot uh, for a tooling grade. So here's a picture of those in the as forged uh, condition. I kind of wish we had some of them kind of tipped over on the side so you can see the interior of what I had before. And here's what they look like flipped upside down and machined. Any questions on, on that one? That's just one example. I have some more, but I want to. No, it's steel. That's a 17.4, which is precipitation hardening, Martin Sitting stainless grade. Okay, so I'll bring in another example if there's no questions on that one. So this one, you can see here we have a, a long skinny forging with a, with a blind ID. Uh, again, something that's, uh, uh, this one's about five and a half feet long. So, how are we gonna make that? Right? We make, we, it's not too hard to make this as a, as a hollow forging that is hollow all the way out to the end. That's actually really easy to do. You make a tube that has a, that has a step on the, on the OD, that's a very simple thing to do. But to make it with the end closed off like that, have all one piece, that's a bit more challenging. Uh, so, we're going to be using some tools to create that. We're going to have some big punches involved. So tapers now become important because otherwise, with such a long hole, if we didn't have the right kind of taper on the tools, we wouldn't be able to get them separated from one another. So we need to simulate that. We need to understand how much weight is needed. Again, because we have, well, this is going to be forged vertically, so we're going to have a, a quite tall stack of tools plus the workpiece, so we have to make sure we have proper daylight. And so it, daylight is basically the distance between the dies. Between the dies, that's right, yep. 
And we, of course, we want to have good, clean corners. Good, we want to have good fill of the tool. That's really what we're talking about there. So here's a picture of it. You can see uh, we have a, a bottom tool. Uh, this is the uh, item. I think it's actually being withdrawn from the tool right there. Um, and then you've actually not shown right now in this view, you'd actually have a big punch on top of that. So all of that has to be all stacked together. Uh, here's what it looks like when it's all done. Right? It's just come out of the tool. You can see that they actually have really nice corners here. Uh, there's going to be machining on this, but you know we don't have really great gradients because we've got fairly crisp corners. Um, you can see the, the hole, of course, you can't see it going all the way through, but it does go all the way in. And what we did with this one, uh, this is actually a process that we would call back extrusion. So you start uh, with uh, a blank or uh, a form that's quite a bit shorter than this, but you're going to put a big hole in it. So you have to displace the metal from the hole and, and make it go down the length of this. Uh, so what you would actually do is, let me go back to, let me go back here to oh, this view here. So you can have the the starting piece is probably you know only sticking up above the tool about that far. When you drive the punch in, the punch is going down. The metal's uh, you know supported by the bottom die. So the metal is actually being forced to flow backwards up around the tool, up around the punch, and of course it squirts out the top here to some degree. Uh, and in this case, it looks like they went back and did uh, some kind of a refining step that's not shown in my series of pictures. That's how your pop can was made. Kind of. Yeah. 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 Except that coal. Yep. I don't know. I don't, they may actually be warm. No, uh, pop cans no, they're cold. Yeah, so essentially you have a punch, but the distance between the punch and the die is really, really small, so when it comes up the sides, it just goes up, back up in that little thin space there. This I think just in the case of a pop can, it's actually all stretching rather than backwards flow. Yeah, I think that would be, I think. Mm, yeah, I could I, be wrong. I have to, I have to look it up. I got some videos on yeah, Well, you, you might be right. I, I don't know for sure. I know that there is a way to do one over the other. Right, you could, you could do it the other uh, way too. But this, in, in the case, you know, you guys may have been maybe familiar with extrusions in, in general. Uh, that's another fine way to make, especially intricate shapes that need to be long. You can take a, a block of metal, put it in a container. There's an opening on one end and a big, uh, a big pusher rod on the other end, and you just push it, and the metal squeezes out like uh, you know cookie dough through a little cookie press. And you can make whatever shape you want. That's kind of this similar kind of concept, except that here the metal is actually flowing backwards around the tool instead of flowing out the front of the tool. We have another one, another example here. This one's a, um, this is actually a little bit more. Uh, so that, that cross section. Uh, so aluminum is, I think I mentioned this once before, is a bit unique in that to stress relieve it, it has to be deformed cold. It's completely opposite of the world of steel, where if you deform something cold, you add all kinds of stress. But aluminum is different. Uh, but when you have to deform it, coal, even though it's aluminum and fairly soft, it still can require quite a high tonnage. So we use our simulation tools to figure out how to do that and how much uh, tonnage is needed. So in, in the world of aluminum, we typically need one, between 1% one and 5% of cold work throughout the whole part. Uh, so in this, in this particular shape, we have to create tooling that allow us to do that. And is that is that to nucleate, uh, recrystallize uh, more easily, or what's what's the idea there? I, I don't honestly know the the, the mechanism behind it. It's, I don't work with aluminum personally, so I know it. I know of it. And I think it's strange because I'm so familiar with steel. Yeah. Uh, but I know it's something we do a lot. It's it's a very common thing to have done on the hmm. aluminum forgings that we make. And here's again a cross section of the tool showing the workpiece. So it's not in this case, it's not a complicated shape by any means. It's just that what we're trying to accomplish is going to require a lot of force. Uh, so the tooling design, understanding which press we need, uh, is important. So here we have uh, different things that we. That we accomplished through simulation, I've already touched on all of these, are you know, K 
can we basically can we make it with the tools we have available, and if so, how are we going to do that? Uh, here's a, another view of a, a forging. I think, I think that might be that aluminum one we were just looking at. So aluminum is, I think, a little bit disappointing because it doesn't glow while you're working it, unless you're melting it. I happen to really like the fact that iron-based materials glow. I, and so I can tell I can tell when it's hot. But aluminum, because that doesn't happen, you actually have to continually check the temperature with a contact probe as you're working it because you can easily overheat it and not realize it because there's no visual cues that that's happening. Here's a cross-section of another, uh, another shape. This is a little kind of similar to the one that we were looking at before. Uh, and again, we've got uh, some tooling. Here you can see this one uh, is using just a straight disc, pushing a punch into it, and we're going to have metal flowing up around the punch. So kind of uh, mostly a back extrusion type of a, of, a, of a job. But in this particular case, the metal isn't going to flow out and be uncontained. This one is going to be completely contained in the tool. So in this, in this example, it's actually very similar to the closed eye stuff that we started the lecture with. Um, we don't typically consider them closed eye because the tools are loose tools. They're not fixed to the hammer, fixed to the press. Uh, but they, they still have the same challenges of having to get metal to fill all the corners and the, all the different uh, force requirements that go along with that. So here's what that looked like when we were all done. Um, and we did that um, under one of our hammers uh, in Franklin Park. So. In this case, they do try to figure out how many blows would be required, and they got really close. The simulation was within two blows uh, to get complete fill and really sharp corners. Now, um, that becomes actually really important when you're dealing with those really intricate dies that we were looking at earlier. Uh, the number of blows needed to make the part is uh, really directly related to the wear and tear on the equipment, on the, on the dies, on the hammer itself. So if you can figure out a way to make it with fewer blows, you're going to be more efficient, you're going to have longer tool life and longer hammer life. I have another example. This one is not a hammer forging, this was a press forging. But you can see the geometry of this is kind of odd. We've got this cylindrical profile with a square section with the square is set at an angle. That's, that's not something you'd be able to really forge as an open die type forging, as a, as a freehand forging, especially since you've got these interesting you know, radius is here. That would be extremely difficult to forge uh, any other way than with specialized tools. And you can see in this view that it's not square corners all the way around. It's got a big radius on the back side here. So again, you would use the simulating tools to figure out how we're going to get a good fill in the corners and the stresses on the tools. Uh, and also in this case, we had the issue of tool uh, misalignment because you had that tapered surface, much like in the example I gave earlier. So here was our solution to that. Uh, rather than having a top and bottom tool that interlock with one another, our solution was to create a ring tool that captured both of them at the same time. It gave the same end result, and you can see here how we started with a cylinder, we put it in the tool, and the metal was forced to flow this direction and this direction. And in this case, we did have some flash, and that was built into the design of this tool. And here's what it looked like after it was done uh, coming out of the tool. You can see the flash, and of course, then that was removed. In our case, that's removed with a, with a cutting torch rather than with, with a dedicated press type uh, trimming die. You, that's what it looks like when it's all trimmed up. So, in summary, uh, we can make complicated shapes as near net forgings. We can use simulating tools to keep the labor and the development costs down. Um, just as in open die work, closed die work is going to have good mechanical properties that are directional because of the grain flow. We've got the benefits of less machining since we're in a near net shape condition. Um, and we can you know, collaborate with what that was supposed to be. I'm not sure why that last point is in there. Um, let's see, we've got one or two more things. Here's a, uh, these are, I think, uh, just interesting because it's a rocket component. Uh, uh, I can't tell you who the customer that locked that out, but this was a rocket nozzle. Uh, I just thought that should be interesting for the class to look at. So you can 
see that the, the geometry, the dimensions, all of it was uh, supplied to us, and then we had to figure out how we were going to make that. So the asport shape is a lot simpler, right? We know that we're not going to put all that detail in there, so we came up with this. And then again, we simulated it, created some tools to figure out how we could make that. So I believe that is back to the last slide. Are there any questions on closed eye work and the use of simulated tools? Yeah? Is there a good way to determine how hard you want the dyes to be? Or like what mechanical properties they should have? Um, yeah, there is. Part of that calculation is going to be understanding the uh, flow characteristics of the metal that you're going to be working, right? So different materials at different temperatures can behave in different ways. So you have to have that as a starting point. Um, and then you're going to need to know how much, once you know that, then, and then you know the shape of that you're trying to make, um, you can use the simulated tool to calculate the load that's going to be required to make that happen. And then that's going to give you a baseline for designing the tool because, of course, you need your tool to be able to withstand that load and not, not crumble or, or, or fail in some way. Um, so that's that's how you can do that. There's, I think, once you do quite a bit of that, you're probably going to become pretty comfortable saying, I need my tools to be, say, 360 for now, or between 300 and 400 for now, or whatever is the necessary range. Typically, you're not going to go with a single hardness number. You're going to have some range in your design that will be uh, effective. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Do heat treat dyes? Do they get heat treated really fast? Um, so the answer will depend on what uh, hardness tempering temperatures you use to do your original heat treatment. Um, I would say that in general, they should not, because you're going to try to pick a tooling material and an operating temperature that will maintain the properties you designed in the tool, right? However, we've had circumstances where things didn't go as planned and work pieces got stuck in tools and so the tools ended up getting a lot hotter than they were designed to get. And then you have to go and simulate the tools again and decide if the, if the change in properties is such that they have to be remanufactured. Do you put them like water cooling built in or anything? So in our tools, we don't have any of that built in. But what you will see quite often is that you'll make, say, one or two pieces in the tools. They will get hot. You'll cool them off in a big tank of water. And so you'll have, if, if, it's, a, if it's a relatively high volume job, you may have multiple tool sets so that you can switch back from one to the other while one's being cooled. And that way, you're able to maintain the temperature. Uh, in other industries, like, say, die casting, they actually will build in uh, you know, cooling in the back side of those dyes and stuff, but not so much on the forging side. Okay. Want to see another question? Oh, yeah. I was just wondering, like, who makes your tooling or how is that process done? And if any of your tooling can be reused for the parts of the show, like across different parts? So, some of our tools are things that are very simple and can be used for lots of different so a great example of that is I just want to make a ring, or, or let's say I, I want to make a, a flange forger. And so the, uh, the, the, the smaller diameter is often produced by taking a slug, you know, some cylinder, putting it inside a ring, upsetting one end, and I've created a flange. And so we have rings, ring tools, of all different sizes. And as long as this size corresponds to something that a customer wants, you can use it on a lot of different jobs. When you get to the more intricate stuff, they're, they're, those are fairly dedicated. Mm -hmm. um, that was the second part of your question. What was the first part of your question? You said you yeah, it. I guess where okay. is it made? So where is it made? Yeah. So when it's fairly simple, like those rings or rings with radius and things like that, we can make that in house. That's just some part you can put in the lathe and you can program it to cut that profile. Mm -hmm. When you have really intricate stuff, um, we're going to send that out to some other manufacturer that has the ability to the intricate machine that we probably don't have the capabilities to do in house. I'm not sure specifically which manufacturers would do that for us. Some of them, sometimes the tools are so large that you're limited to only a few machine shops that can handle stuff of that size. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of a combination. 
Any other questions? Um, we're, the, the microphone's not working, so I'll just talk loud. Um, so we're looking at some of these microstructures. Um, uh, equip, this, is, this is not necessarily a, um, the person is polishing this. It's more the, I think, part of the equipment. Um, they're over etched though a little bit. Uh, so we got to go to a little bit lower horsepower etchant maybe. Uh, I don't know if we can get pickerel. Uh, what is it got again? It's got... Uh, it's picric acid. Picric, picric acid, what, what percent? And